Good evening. It's a delight to be with you. Uh, do you realize how important this conference is? As I work with Koreans, uh, I'm utterly convinced that what you are doing here is of profound significance. Well, as I begin, I want to do something personal. I want to offer a word of congratulations to my dear friend, Pastor Paul Chung. You see, Paul is going to graduate with his D-men from Biblical Seminary in just a few days. So join with me in expressing our appreciation. You know, Paul and I actually bonded when he gave me a chapter of his D-Man thesis. And I read that and I learned so much. And so for that, for the friendship, for the insight, I am very, very grateful. So thank you, Paul. It's been uh, some 30 years 30 years ago when I was a seminary student in Philadelphia and I served as an English minister at Young Knack Presbyterian Church in Ambler, Pennsylvania. I was the EM for four years during my seminary time and I learned some wonderful things about my Korean brothers and sisters. Uh, what's interesting is that it's only in the providence of God that a Texan, I'm from Texas, I had never actually met a Korean in my life before I came to Philadelphia. And only in God's providence would he have brought me into fellowship and co-laboring in a first-generation Korean church uh, with the kids? Well, that began for me a long-standing affinity and deep affection uh, for my Korean brothers and sisters. In fact, in just a couple of days, I'll be heading off to Korea <laughs> Uh, for about the sixth or seventh time in the last three or so years. At any rate, uh, I'm, I'm pleased uh, to be here. It is a great privilege and an honor that I am actually invited to speak to you. Uh, my topic tonight is the gospel. Wow. Now that's a big challenge to talk about the gospel and to explain it and to expound upon it. But I'm, I'm up for the task, I think. Some of you will know the name William Tyndale. William Tyndale was a, uh, an English reformer back in the 16th century. He's the guy who translated the Bible into English, and it cost him his life. Well, as I've read Tyndale over the years, I've come across his definition of the gospel. Listen to William Tyndale, the great William Tyndale. This is how he talks about the gospel. He says, and I quote, It signifies good, merry, glad and joyful tidings, and it makes a man's heart glad, and it makes him to sing, to dance, and to leap for joy. That's, in his mind, what the gospel is supposed to do to you and to me. It is such a joyous thing that we're to dance and sing and be joyful. 
Now, Tyndale's definition focuses more on the human response to the hearing of the gospel. But it does capture something of just how good the good news really is. It evokes joy and glad tidings. The gospel ought to make us ecstatic with joy. It ought to make us leap for joy. You see, the gospel is a joyous proclamation. Well, I wanted to look at a text with you tonight, which is the focus of how I am coming at and talking about our gospel. The text is in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. Let me just add, the seminary uh, is in a process of relocation. We're moving to Philadelphia in a beautiful area near the museums. And as we've announced on our website, we're going to be undergoing a name change. It's not official yet, but it's going to happen. But I want everybody to know that we are still biblical. And so I have a biblical text that I believe is true, and I want that to be the basis of my proclamation of my talk to you tonight about the gospel. So, we're all biblical, right? That's the goal, to be biblical. This is Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. After John was put in prison... Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. Obviously, in Mark's account of what Jesus said, this idea of the good news was very much on the mind and on the lips of Jesus as he launched his ministry. He came to bring good news. Tonight I'd like to talk about three general topics. Very simply, I want to talk about the gospel in relationship to God, the gospel in relationship to Jesus, and the gospel in relationship to the mission. God, Jesus, and the mission. Are you ready? What does this text, what does Mark in his account Tell us about the gospel, about the good news. What is it about what Jesus said as he launched his ministry that would cause Tyndale, William Tyndale, to sing and to dance and to leap for joy? Well, as we get into expounding this, I want to make an observation. And you'll have to forgive me because I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't see any purpose in me getting up here and talking if I'm not going to be honest. And here's what I mean. In my judgment, the evangelical church in North America in particular, we have become very used to a truncated gospel. We, are all, we all too often reduce it to two or three or four points. We try to make the gospel small enough to fit on a business card. 
small enough to put on a tract that we can pass out. I remember when I was in college, I was a very serious Christian. And I got involved in organ an organization because I wanted to share the gospel. And I remember going to a gathering, and I was, I was supposed to share the gospel and give it to people. And I remember walking away thinking, what have I done? I have handed a lot of people a piece of paper with four points on it. I did not invest in a relationship with those people. I didn't know them. I didn't know their family. I didn't know diddly bip about them. But I was told that I was sharing the gospel when I handed them a business card or a small tract. That, my friends, is a reductionist view of the gospel in my humble opinion. If you really want to share the gospel, it seems to me you have to take the time to get to know someone, to help them understand the depth, the breadth, and the expanse of the gospel, of the good news. Or as I sometimes say, you need to earn the right to speak into someone's life. If I just walk up to you and I hand you a tract, I'm not sure that I am showing you the proper respect that you deserve as a person made in God's image. You see, everyone is made in God's image and they deserve respect and honor, at least insofar as sharing the gospel. And so, for me, a long time ago, I remember being troubled by the way we did evangelism, troubled by the way we shared the gospel. So what I'd like to do tonight, as we delve into Mark chapter 1, is so what I'd like to do is to give you a sense of the expanse, of the magnitude, of the vista, of the good news. I can't tell you everything, but if I can just give you a glimpse of the expanse, of the breadth of the gospel, we will all be well served, I think. So the first thing, as I reflect upon Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, it's quite clear, there's no debate about this in the least, the gospel is an announcement. It's a proclamation, a declaration. And it's an announcement that God has fulfilled His promises. Frankly, the gospel tells us something about the character of God. That He is the God who keeps his promises. Is that good news? Is that the kind of thing that ought to make us leap for joy? A God who doesn't keep his promises does not inspire confidence. A God who doesn't keep his promises is not someone who causes joyful tidings at all. So in the first place, the gospel the good news is first and foremost news about what God has done. The gospel is about what God has done. And there's another layer to it. It's not just about what God has done. 
but it's a declaration that what God has promised in the past, according to Mark, has now come to pass. This is what Mark means when he says, the good news of God. That's the phrase he uses in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. He speaks of the good news of God. Now we translate the word gospel, comes from the Greek word evangelion, the good news, or the gospel. The truth of the matter is, is that the English word gospel comes from an Anglo-Saxon word. And that Anglo-Saxon word is the word God spell. God spell. And what that translates for our purposes, and technically, is God's story. That's what God spell means in Anglo-Saxon. It means God's story. And so in the first place, the gospel, the good news, is about God's story. Are you with me? The gospel is about God's story. Now, some of you may uh, know that there was actually a, a Broadway show back in the 70s called Godspell, based roughly on the uh, account of the life of Christ uh, in Gospel of Matthew. Well, this God story is part of a larger unfolding of the God story that began in the Old Testament. The gospel is part of a larger unfolding of the God story that began in the Old Testament. Indeed, the more you are aware of those ancient God promises, the greater your joy at the announcement that those promises have come true. Again, it gets back to the character of God. Is he the God who makes promises but doesn't keep them? Or is he the God who makes promises and follows through? It's the God story. Now, the origins, the historical origins of the gospel go back to the nation Israel. In particular, it goes back to some of the prophets like Isaiah. This whole first chapter of Mark actually begins by quoting Isaiah. Just a few verses before verses 14 and 15, notice that it begins by quoting from Isaiah the prophet. That alone tells you that the God story has a long historical arc that begins in the Old Testament and finds its fulfillment in the New. What it says in the very second verse, as it is written, Mark chapter 1, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, goes down to verse 3, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight his paths. It's very interesting that prophet Isaiah has delivered in the Old Testament a series of prophecies about the God story. In rather vivid imagery, he speaks of a, a future redeemer of Israel, who will come to Zion preaching good news. Good news to the poor and proclaiming freedom for the captives. The famous prophecy from Isaiah is in chapter 61. I want you to know this gospel 
goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Isaiah 61 declares, I just love saying this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, writes Isaiah 61, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The gospel has its origins in the Old Testament. Isaiah 52, 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. In Isaiah 40, Isaiah foresees a herald who will bring good news to Zion and good news to Jerusalem. Even when you look in the New Testament, Galatians 3, 8 and 9, there Paul reminds us that God had announced to Abraham back in Genesis 12, quote, the gospel in advance. At some fundamental level, Abraham was given the gospel ahead of time. All of this is to say that the gospel is God's story. And that story begins in the Old Testament. Are you starting to see a little bit that the God who makes promises and keeps them, that is a cause for joy and delight. And to put a very fine point on the historical origins of this good news, Jesus himself explicitly identifies with Isaiah's prophecy in, six, in, chat, in Isaiah 61. In Luke 4, we have the story of where Jesus, in his hometown of Nazareth, is on a Sabbath, and he's at the synagogue, and he stands up and he asks for the scroll. And he takes the scroll and he reads Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He, God, has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then a few verses later, Jesus announces to those in the synagogue, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus identifies with the promises of God and that he is the ultimate fulfillment. So in sum, the first thing we need to understand about the good news is that it belongs to the overarching story of God as initially manifested in the Old Testament. To look at it slightly differently, the gospel is not just about a future heavenly reward. It's not merely about salvation in the present. It is about the eternal God story, the eternal God spell the eternal good news. Somehow in God's story, he weaves together the past, the present, and the future for his purposes to declare good news to us. So that's the first thing. The gospel is about God. It's about God's story. The second thing, that is very, very important, if you want to have a sense of the expanse of the gospel, is that God has fulfilled his promises in Jesus of Nazareth.
The God story, although it covers a vast period of time, it centers on Jesus. Brothers and sisters, there is no gospel. There is no good news. There is no God story, ultimately, apart from Jesus. Now that means that the God story, the gospel, doesn't begin with me. It includes me. It includes my response to God's announcement. But the God story is not primarily anthropocentric. It's actually theocentric and Christocentric. It's God-centered and Christ-centered. God's promises are being fulfilled and will be fulfilled in Jesus and in Jesus alone. He's the centerpiece. Mark actually says this in the very first verse. He says, the good news about Jesus the Messiah. So he connects the announcement of good news, the announcement that God keeps his promises with Jesus. You see what's happening? The God who makes promises, those promises are kept in Jesus. He's the demonstration, the ultimate demonstration, that when God says he's going to do something, he does it and he does it in Jesus and Jesus alone. Scott McKnight likes to say, the gospel is to announce the story of Jesus, who is the Messiah, King, Lord, and Savior, and fulfills or completes the story of Israel. It is the good news that God's promises have now been realized in Jesus. The gospel is an announcement of a past event and the reality of this event ensures our future and transforms the present. All of those things are at work in this expansive view of the gospel that transcends time. It's the eternal God story. Well, One of the things you notice in the New Testament when there's a discussion of the gospel, the good news, it's often identified with the kingdom of God. We see, for example, the gospel is identified with the kingdom of God in Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John, since then the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. Acts 8. When they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God. So let me set it up for you. When we talk about Jesus and we talk about him as the ultimate fulfillment of the promises of God, the guarantee that the God who makes promises keeps his promises bound up in who and what Jesus does is this language of the kingdom of God. This is a part of the eternal God story. Now we often think when we hear the kingdom of God, we think in our minds about some sort of geographical territory. That's not what the kingdom of God is about, some geographical territory territory. It's really about the kingship of Jesus. It's about the rule of Jesus. It is God ruling in and through Jesus. Yes, there is a, an already not yet quality to the kingdom of God. It has come but the final consummation is still awaiting. Are you with me on that? It's one of the frustrating things in our day. 
We believe in Jesus, and we look for transformed lives. We look for evidence that the kingdom of God has come, and sometimes it's hard to find, isn't it? You turn on the television set, and you see horrible things, and you say, where is the kingdom of God? It's frustrating, but that's where we need to be reminded that there is an already and a not yet. The kingdom has come. You're here. I'm here. We are members of that kingdom. But there's still a dimension that is yet to be fulfilled. That will come at the second coming of Jesus. So we look at this coming of the kingdom, this kingdom of God, this announcement that God keeps His promises in Jesus. Now this announcement of the kingdom carries with it the need for a human response. It's not just an announcement. It's an announcement that demands a response. So when God announces the coming of the kingdom, these are not just words. These are such powerful words that they demand a response. And Mark tells us what that response should be. Verse 15, the good news requires that we repent and believe. Repent and believe. Now, if you look at the Greek grammar, <clears throat> I'm not going to, don't, don't get nervous. We're not going to do a lot of Greek exegesis. But the words repent and believe really denote two aspects of conversion. It's really sort of two sides of the same coin to repent and to believe. One implies the other. To repent implies belief or faith. Repentance implies faith and faith implies repentance. In other words, you cannot separate the turning away from sin, repentance, and the coming to Christ in faith. They describe a basic action of those who belong to the kingdom of God. It's, it's turning away from and a turning to, and that's sort of a single action. You can't just do one without the other. They go together, turning away from sin and turning to Christ in faith. Let me just say why that's important. We live in a world, we live in an America. I, can, I don't want to speculate about Korea, but I think it's true of Korea too. You have people who say they believe in Jesus, but their lives do not reflect it. There's no true turning away from. There's a lack of repentance. And what I want to suggest to you tonight is that those two things must go together. No true repentance, then there's no true faith. And there's no true faith without true repentance. Can I get an amen? amen? Absolutely. It's interesting that when Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the gospel and what it is, he lays stress that what we must believe, have faith in, trust in, confidence in, <coughs> is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15. This is the flashpoint. You see, belief isn't just a general idea. It has specificity to it. It's belief that Jesus was dead and rose again for our sake. You have no gospel there is no faith. You cannot have a proper response to the God story, to the gospel, to the good news without faith and repentance. Faith in the resurrection. Brothers and sisters, this is the linchpin of our faith, of our belief. 
without the resurrection, the death to life, we are of all people to be most pitied, as Paul says. The good news is that God has raised Jesus from the dead and therefore declared in one fell swoop that the kingdom of God has come and that evil has been defeated. We can say then that the gospel is a royal announcement that the crucified and risen Jesus who died for our sins and rose again according to the scriptures has now been enthroned as the true Lord of this world. And when this gospel is preached, this God story, where God calls people to salvation out of sheer grace and mercy, leading them to repentance and faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a proper response to this good news. And this good news ought to cause us to leap and dance and sing because it really is good news. So we've talked about God and the gospel, the God story. We've talked about Jesus and how he is the demonstration that God who makes promises keeps them and that we have to have faith and repentance according to Mark. And those two things go together and the object of our faith, the source of our repentance is belief in the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now we come to the third key element that I want to talk about tonight, and that is the mission of the God story. There's yet another layer to what we mean by the gospel. You see, God's story, the gospel, is one in which you and I are called to participate. You see, the gospel is not out there. It's not over there. It's not something that someone else does. It's, it changes us, and it invites us to enter into the God story, into the God spell, you can't just hear the gospel. You can't just apprehend it intellectually. Seminaries don't always do a good job at this level. You see, the gospel is not just about what you know. It's about who you are and how you engage and how you live out the gospel. If the gospel does not include your hands and your feet and your heart, then you have missed the gospel, the God story, in a profound way. In a very real sense, the gospel, the God story, causes us to reimagine the church a, a more expansive, a deeper, a multi-layered understanding of the gospel causes us to reimagine the church's identity. The church is no longer simply a collection of people who have accepted the promise of salvation, who are simply awaiting heavenly glory. Those are true, but it's not just that. The church is also supposed to be an active and engaging community. It represents you and I, every single one of you who name the name of Christ, you, the gospel, God's story calls you to engage in the community around you. You represent the kingdom of God. You are the kingdom of God in a very real sense.
You are to engage your neighbor, believers and unbelievers. You are to engage in your community in all kinds of ways. You see, the church is supposed to be a foretaste of God's kingdom and an agent of blessing in the community. Let me talk about that a little bit more. The mission of God's story means that internally we are different. We live differently. Again, I cannot underscore how strongly I can emphasize this. We are to live differently. We have to reflect the fact that we belong to the king and we inhabit his kingdom. The church and the people in it are to be formed, shaped by various practices where the story of God is not just in words, but it's in deed. The story of God needs to transform and shape us. We are to reflect the values of love and mercy and justice. We are to display among ourselves hospitality and reconciliation. I believe the gospel has power. Indeed, Paul says the gospel has power in Romans 1.16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. So you see, we're not left in our own strength. God sent his spirit. And may I say that we have not in the evangelical world talked enough about the power of the Holy Spirit. We have failed. We have failed miserably to not talk about and rely upon and call upon the Holy Spirit to help us live out internally what it means to be part of the kingdom of God, to be part of God's story. <clears throat> the church exists to serve God's mission, to announce to the world that Jesus is the Lord and that we are to be transformed even as we try to transform others. So, the gospel, the mission of God, all of that means that we live out our lives in different ways. That's internally. There's a discipleship that must go on, a holiness that must go on among us and between us. But there's an external dimension to this kingdom of God, to the mission of God. The gospel, the God story, tells us that we must pursue relationships in our community. We must enter into partnerships with people to make the community a better place. We join those who seek to infuse new life into those whose lives are broken and whose lives are experiencing pain. We ought to be the most compassionate people in our country, in our communities. Quick story. In the early church, in the first centuries, the early church was known for its compassion. One of the illustrations of this is that in the pagan world, life was very cheap. And there was a real a bias against little girls in the first century. The lives of female babies were dispensable. And we know that the pagans, because they valued boys more than they did girls, we know that what pagans would do is they would, if a, child, if a, if a female was born into a pagan home, it was not unusual for that family to take that little girl, that newborn girl, and cast her 
on the dung heap outside the village, left to die of exposure. That's how pagans thought about little baby girls or little boys who had some sort of physical aff uh, affliction. They too were cast in the dung heap. That's the refuse, that's the garbage, that's the human waste outside the village. That's how pagans thought about infants, especially little girls. And do you know what the Christians did in the village? They would climb through the refuse and the human waste and they would rescue those little girls and those little boys and raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Do you know why Christianity expanded throughout the Roman Empire despite persecution after persecution after persecution? Because the world had not seen this kind of compassion ever before. It was a new ethic, a new way of engaging the community around them living differently, treating people differently, making the community a better place, taking up the discarded and the discarded for the name and for the sake of Jesus. The mission of God, the God story, tells us that we are to love our neighbors. And by loving our neighbors, we live out the God story. We live out the gospel. We live out the good news. And by doing service with others for others, it deepens our own faith. Well, one of the great, great truths when we think about the gospel or God's story is that God's original intention was to create a world of goodness and life. Remember in the first chapter of Genesis, after God created the world, he said, it's very good. That's the language that God pronounces over his creation. Now we know that by chapter 3, sin invades and corrupts this good creation of God. But here's the really good news, brothers and sisters. When you talk about the overarching, the expansiveness of the God story, God never gave up on His original plan of redemption, the original plan in creation. He has already demonstrated that he loves his creation, he loves his people, and he has never, ever given up that original plan of reconciliation. And you see that manifested in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the establishment of the kingdom of God, the blessing of those other people. At the deepest level, the God story tells us about who God is. Do you remember the story in Exodus? And Moses asks God, I'd like to see your glory. Show me your glory, God. Show me what you're really about. Show me who you really are. And God said, I will show you my glory. And in Exodus 34, we're told, The Lord passed in front of Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity. Moses asked to see God's glory. And we're told in Exodus 33 that God showed him his goodness. Moses asked to see God's glory, and God showed him his goodness. Moses asked to see God's glory, and God showed him his goodness, his compassion, his grace, his loving kindness, 
is forgiveness. God is in himself good. And it is he who declares and announces the good news of Jesus Christ. This is God's story. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's God's story. It's God's story in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. And it is God's mission. It's God's eternal mission that what he said he's going to do, what he originally planned to do in the beginning, has now in the process of being completed. Gregory the Great, an 8th century theologian, wrote a six-volume commentary on the book of Job. That must have been a challenging process. But he says something very interesting. I want to close with this. He says, Scripture is like a river, shallow enough for a lamb to go wading across, but deep enough for an elephant to swim in. The gospel is a lot like that. It is easy enough to understand at one level, and yet it's deep enough. It's as deep as the nature of God. On the one hand, the gospel is so simple that a lamb can wade in it. And on the other hand, it's deep enough for an elephant to swim in. The foundations of the gospel is to love God and to love your neighbor. It's as simple as following Jesus into the world. And yet, the God story is as deep and profound as the triune nature of eternal God. It's deep enough for an elephant to swim in and shallow enough for a baby lamb to, to wade across. The gospel is expansive. Well, when you hear this vision of the gospel that spans the Old Testament to the New Testament to now and into the future, it's no wonder that William Tyndale said, it's enough to make you sing and dance and to leap for joy. Can I get an amen? amen? Let me pray for us. Father, we are grateful to you. We are thankful for the God story that informs our lives, shapes us from the inside out, that it's a transformative experience to hear this announcement that you have kept your promises and that you have kept your promises in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And that upon hearing this wonderful announcement, by your Spirit we are compelled to turn away from our sinfulness and to turn to Christ in faith. I pray, dear Father, that that transformative truth, that God story, that God spell, will not only give us a mind to our own spiritual benefit, to our own heavenly reward, but to live out the gospel in our hands and our feet by engaging others, by loving our neighbors in ways that they can't even comprehend, that they can't explain, but they see it and they feel it. And so they feel compelled to come and to engage your story. May your blessing be upon us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.